Now, I have often wondered if the doors open and Jesus were to walk in right now, and he wondered throughout this room whether he would select any of us to be in his inner circle, to follow him near and far. Jesus was the greatest recruiter the world has ever known. As a teacher, as a mentor, as a trainer, he is the greatest of all time. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, and at the same time, the God of the armies of Israel. He is the only one that resurrected. His tomb is the only one that's empty, and he lives sitting in the throne next to the Father. But if you receive him as your Lord and Savior, he's alive and living in your heart. Amen? Jesus started his ministry of three years immediately following his baptism on the Jordan River. He was baptized by his first cousin, John the Baptist. Now, for Jesus, the first order of business was to select and to train the men that would expand the gospel and expand his kingdom here on earth. Now, this was not a band of volunteers. This was not a task that was a second priority to Jesus. This was not something that Jesus delegated. It is written. It is not Willie Bermejo telling you this morning. It is written in the book of Luke, Matthew, and Mark, that late one evening, Jesus went to pray in the woods, and the next morning, Jesus handpicked, hand-selected the 12 disciples. Now, these were men from all walks of life. They were common men and uncommon leaders. Now, one interesting fact is that his top draft choices, they were all businessmen. Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, they were all fishermen. Twelve were not all the same. There was no affirmative action in those days. There was no department of equity and inclusion in those days. John, Peter, and James were special to Jesus. And they received special treatment. You may remember the day that Jesus arrived in the shores of Capernaum. And a crowd gathered around him. And in that crowd was Jairus. His daughter was critically ill. And Jesus followed Jairus to Jairus' house. Along the way, a messenger came and said, Jairus, says, no, don't bother the rabbi any longer. Your daughter has died. They kept on because Jesus, impressed by the faith of Jairus when he said, don't fear, just believe. And when they got to Jairus' house, going inside Jairus' house was Jairus, Jairus' wife, Jesus, and three others. John, James, and Peter. Now, Peter was a great orator, a great speaker. John was a great writer, all great communicators. But for Jesus, it was not one size fits all. The mentoring and the training of these 12 disciples was of utmost importance to Jesus. And he always started the training with one question. What are you looking for? And it was Jesus' way to get to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is to reveal your heart's intent. Now, Jesus not only expected, but he was very demanding. And Jesus demanded three things. He demanded obedience. He demanded love, which was loyalty. And he demanded fruitfulness. Now, it is written in the book of John, chapter 13, and I assume we'll have it on the screens. Chapter 13, verse 35, the word says, it is written, By this all men will know that you are my disciples. 
if you have love for one another. And further in the book of John in chapter 15, verse 8, it, the word says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. Now this verse is important, and I'm going to come back to this, because there are two aspects here. One is glorifying God. The other is proving discipleship. By way of his ministry of three years, Jesus taught us that if you want to have leaders that can have a profound change in the world, we must do three things. We must train them. We must trust them. And we must task them. I'm going to repeat that again. We need to do three things if we're going to have leaders. If we're going to have leaders here in Alpha and Omega. We must train them. We must trust them. And we must task them. Amen? And Jesus let his disciples know that he had come here to serve, not to be served. And he told his disciples, come and follow me, not just to hear me, but to bear witness about what I am about to do. And during three years of ministry, Jesus taught, trained, mentored them, and they were witness to 39 miracles that he performed and the things that the disciples saw and heard changed their lives forever. But more importantly, it increased their faith. Listen, when you have a strong faith like the centurion, you have the courage to withstand any threat, any adversity, any challenge that may come along your way. When you have a strong faith, you have the perseverance and the stamina to wait patiently for God to do his work and to finish what you started. And how do you increase your faith? By continuously hearing the word, by continuously confessing the word, and by continuously doing the word. The teaching of the growth of your faith was... One of the priorities of Jesus Christ in the teaching and mentoring of the 12 disciples. But aside from teaching, training, and mentoring, the second phase of leadership development of Jesus with the disciples was the issue of trust. And trust means that you empower, that you inspire and authorize others around you to go and act. And the third part of leadership development was to task. And to task means that you provide clear, concise commands of what needs to be done. It was close to the third year of ministry. And Jesus and the disciples had left Bethany and they were on their way to Jerusalem. It was a 45 minute travel time by foot. The night before, they had spent the night at the house of Lazarus together with Mary and Martha. But this morning, they leave Bethany. It's early, and they're hungry. Now, there were no IHOPs, Denny's, or McDonald's between Bethany and Jerusalem. In the distance, Jesus sees a fig tree. And as they approach the fig tree, the fig tree had leaves. And the leaves are a sign of a season of fruit. But as they get close, Jesus sees that the fig tree has leaves, but it has no fruit. And Jesus proceeds to curse the fig tree with his disciples next to him. And they saw and heard him as Jesus said to the fig tree, may no one ever eat fruit from thee again. Now, Jesus did not pray. They didn't hold hands around the fig tree. He gave a command, a decree with authority of an end desired result. He didn't wait around to see what would happen next. And they left on their way to Jerusalem. As they arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus went immediately to the temple. 
to his father's house. Now, the temple had been built by King Herod, and it was an architectural masterpiece of the times. And there were four courtyards in this temple. The courtyard of the Holy of Holies, the most sacred of them all, the courtyard of the Jews, the courtyard of the women. In those days, the women prayed in different areas than the men. And the courtyard of the Gentiles. And as they entered the courtyard of the Gentiles, the courtyard had been turned into a stockade of livestock. There were lamb, sheep, pigeons, you name it. And it was full of money changers all over the place. The Sadducees and the Pharisees had converted the temple into a Walmart of sorts for the pilgrims that would come to Jerusalem for Passover. Jews from all over the world would travel thousands and thousands and thousands of miles to come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. It is estimated that over a quarter million sheep, lamb, and pigeons were sold. And by controlling the temple grounds, the Sanhedrin had cornered the business. And it was big business, very big business. So right on temple grounds, you had a one-stop shopping. You could exchange your currency regardless of where you came from. An Asia Manor doesn't really matter. They would have money changers for you. And you would then proceed to buy pigeons, lamb, or sheep, whatever it was. It was big business. It was a tremendous operation. They were running it like clockwork. There was price gouging, and the Jewish hierarchy was lining their coffers with gold and silver. And this little well-known carpenter from Nazareth got in their way. Upon entering the temple, Jesus caused havoc. He chased away the vendors. He scolded the people that were exchanging money. He turned the tables over and he told them, isn't it written that my house will be called the house of worship for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Now hearing this were the disciples. They were seeing what Jesus had just done. But also hearing it, were members of the Pharisees and Sadducees that by now they were trailing his every move, watching his every act, hearing his every word, and conspiring which ways best to kill him. Listen, when you try to clean the swamp, the power brokers, the influence peddlers will put you in their crosshairs. Does that seem... Similar to something you hear nowadays. So the disciples ushered Jesus out of the temple. At nightfall, out of the gates of Jerusalem. And next morning, they were on their way back from Jerusalem to Bethany. And as they passed the fig tree that Jesus had cursed the day before, Peter turns to Jesus and says, Rabbi, the fig tree that you cursed has withered away. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, have faith in God. What Jesus meant to say was, Peter, have the faith of God. Have a godly faith. And then Jesus proceeded to teach the disciples the law of faith, which is the cornerstone of the 10 lessons that I give here at the AO Bible Institute, which you all know as the book of Mark chapter 11 Verse 23 to 24. And the word says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Now, who is whosoever? We are, right? You and me. And what is a mountain? The mountain is that pink slip you received last week that maybe says that you're no longer needed in this job. It may be that word you got from your boss that says that the promotion that you were expecting it's going to go to someone else. That mountain may be a blood work report that you got that just didn't show that you were where you thought you were going to be. Or maybe you just heard from a loved one that is not going to be around anymore. And the word says, whosoever shall say to that mountain, cast out 
into the sea and shall not doubt, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Now, this teaching underlines the cornerstone of faith. We need to know the word, obviously, to believe the faith. We, least, we have to believe the word. We have to confess. We have to say it. That's why at the end it says, he shall have whatever soever he said. You have to confess, you have to declare, and then you have to act on the word. But it is the context, it is the context of that principal teaching of faith that I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the context. The cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. They both happened in the same span of 24 hours. Now, Jesus was visibly upset in both words and action. There are not too many places in the gospel that you're going to see Jesus upset. But in this 24 hour, he was upset in words and action. Now, Jesus never acted in malice, disdain, or vengeance. Every action of Jesus was of divine providence. So he would leave with us a teaching that would be inspiring, a teaching that would expand our faith, and a teaching that would serve us as a guidance in our life's journey. Theologians, men of cloth, teachers of the word, believe that this passage is a metaphor for the people of Israel that did not receive, that rejected Jesus, and the Pharisees that persecuted him. I have read this passage hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. And I will share with you, when I meditate on this passage, what the revelation from the Holy Spirit has told me. That this passage is about you and me. We are the fig tree. And we are the temple in both stories. Particularly in the world that we live in today. We live in a world surrounded by a society that's so fickle, so superficial, a society that is addicted to material labels, where the worth of something is not its substance, but what it's called for. A society that is obsessed with self-promotions. Now, the fact that we're obsessed with self-promotion tells me that we are in the final of times. Not because I say so, but because it is written. The Apostle Paul, in his letters to his beloved Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the word says, In the last days, men shall be lovers of themselves. Covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient, and unthankful. I'm sure you've seen many folks, maybe some are within your families or colleagues of yours that they are addicted to selfies. They can't help themselves. There's a focus on self and narcissism. Have you ever been written an email to someone or texting someone and you find yourself that everything you've written is about I and me instead of we? And you catch yourself, and then you say, you know, that doesn't sound right. That sounds too arrogant. Sounds too selfish. Let me go back and change it. Has that ever happened to you? If we're to be followers of Jesus, if we are to be disciples of Jesus, if we are to be leaders in his kingdom, we need to take Jesus' contextual teachings to heart. We cannot pretend like the fig tree. We cannot be fake. We must be authentic and genuine. There's no place for political correctness. You've heard, you've heard some politicians say that, but it's so true. You cannot be politically correct if it obfuscates transparency and sincerity. And we must shed all the excess baggage that we carry. 
we need to shed excess and toxic relationships that detract, detain you, and take you away from the Christian walk. As Christians, we need to recognize that if we're born again, we are the temple where Jesus lives in our hearts. And that temple is a place that has no room for greed, malice, unforgiveness, or vengeance. And just like you clean your house, just like you cut the lawn, just like you wash your cars on a weekly basis, you, meet, you need to make sure that your temple is clean. And you listen and you learn from the words of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, to the Jews living in Rome in those days, in chapter 12, verse 2, where he said, don't be conformed to this world. Don't succumb to this superficial, superficial stuff that I just mentioned. Don't, don't be part of that. Reject it. Separate yourself from it. Who you become acquainted with and who you surround yourself with, who you socialize with, before you know it, you become them. Don't be conformed to this world. Transform yourself, renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? By reading the Word of God. So that you may be certain of what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Jesus is telling us that he doesn't just want us to be people that we can talk like a Christian. He wants us to be people that act like a Christian. He wants us to bear fruit, to walk the walk, to mean what we say and say what we mean. And I realize that it's not easy. I realize that most of our adult lives, we spend a majority of our time trying to please our loved ones, trying to please our colleagues, trying to please our pastor, trying to please your boss, your supervisor, wherever you are, we look for their acceptance, we look for their approval, we look for their love, we always want the best light to be shining upon us, but the danger that lies ahead of you are the decisions that we make amongst the choices that we have. I want to repeat that again. The danger that lies ahead of us are the decisions that we make, that you make, amongst the choices that you have. We live in a society that is going through rapid change, rapid technological change. In the 1990s, the internet was invented. And now we have artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, mathematical algorithms can make it possible for you, for me, to paint a picture of ourselves which is pretty, which is acceptable, which is pleasing, but which is not real. We may show that we have leaves, but we have no fruit. <laughs> Technology may make it possible for us to make money out of someone's grief, sorrow, or misfortune. I'm sure that you've seen cases where people either get divorced or somebody dies and immediately you're getting barraged with emails and accesses for people trying to sell you something. And it's not that technology is bad. Technology is a tool. And you can use it for good or you can use it for bad. And what this story, what this contextual story that I'm sharing with you is telling us from Jesus from 2,000 years ago is this. Don't intentionally or unintentionally misguide anyone about something that you're not. It is telling us to cleanse our hearts of greed, of malice, and unforgiveness. Because the kingdom of God requires leaders like you and I with a heart that is clean, 
that is authentic and genuine, and that is fruitful. So in closing, I'm going to ask all of you here today to please stand with me where you're at. Please stand. And if there's anybody here today or watching me on live stream or on Facebook, and you're ready to let Jesus Christ become that compass, that GPS in your heart, I want to pray with you together with Pastor Eric here this morning. Because I want today to be your day that you say and that you declare that your life has purpose, that your life has meaning. I want each of you here to be able to say that you are beautiful inside and outside because you were created in God's image. I want everyone here to be able to say and to declare that Jesus loves you the way you are, not the way that someone else may want you to be with no need to pretend that you are what you're not. And if you're here, you're watching me, and you know that you are hitting right now the guardrails of temptation, then I want you to say that today is the day that you shed yourselves of toxic relationships, toxic acquaintances, toxic habits, and addictions that keep you and derail you and distract you and confuse you from walking the Christian walk. That today is the day that you shed yourself of all pretentiousness and of all unforgiveness. And that today is a day that you say, in Jesus' name, I will be fruitful for two reasons. Because now I know that I glorify him. And I also know that by doing so, I will be proving that I am a disciple of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>